um, we're going to be recording this session, as you've seen. Um, my name is Ana Martina. I am the trainer and technical assistance uh, manager at the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives. My pronouns are she, her, and ella. And today I am um, introducing just a presentation uh, for this first webinar that we're having in the year. We're very excited. Um, we're gonna be talking about tools for accountability. And it's such an important topic for our worker cooperatives and democratic workplaces. So we're very excited to start with this session. Um, so this is the agenda that we're gonna be using today. We're gonna be doing some introductions. We're gonna be talking a little bit about the Federation and um, the work with the co-op clinic. And then we're gonna be um, introducing the facilitator and presenters, and we're gonna be sharing some tools for accountability. And this session is gonna have a model of peer learning where we are gonna be learning from uh, two amazing worker owners. They are joining us today to share some of their practices in their worker cooperatives. So um, as I was mentioning, I am a staff member of the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives. We are a national grassroots membership organization for worker cooperatives in the US. And uh, part of the work that we do is uh, offering technical assistance for members of the Federation. So this is part of the work that we're doing today with the co-op clinic. And today we are also um, being joined um, with the Canadian Worker Co-op Federation that is also supporting uh, this session with the participation of some of their members to share some of their best practices. They're a cross-sector organization that supports uh, cooperatives in Canada. So as I was mentioning, this is part of a series of webinars for the co-op clinic. The Co-op Clinic is a program of the Federation that uh, they provides technical assistance, training, and facilitation for members of worker cooperatives and democratic workplaces. Uh, if you need support in your business, you can request assistance by going to the link in the slide, usworker.coop slash clinic and um, we can start by uh, listening what are your needs and we have a many of services we have a lot of peer advisors that provide support and our services are bilingual in english or spanish depending on your needs so I invite you to go there and we have a lot of resources there available for you as well so today, um, Daniela Preisler is going to be with us. Um, she is a member of Colmenar Cooperative Consulting. She's originally from Chile. She's a cooperative developer since uh, 2017 and certified coach and trainer. Um, she graduated from the MBA from uh, Next Economy as a former worker owner of Home Green Home where she developed her experience as a leader of the Financial and Administration Committee for seven years, is co-founder of Colmenar Cooperative Consultant, which provides consultant services to cooperatives and democratic workplaces, and is, is also the president of Sicopa North America. And Daniela is gonna be facilitating the session today. Uh, so we're very excited and thankful for uh, Daniela to come and share some of her knowledge and uh, expertise. We're also going to be joined by Marcelino Martinez, uh, who is a member of Radia Consulting, a uh, worker cooperative here in the United States in New York City. And we're going to be hearing more from Marcelino in a little bit um, once when he joins the session in the peer learning uh, section of it. We're also joined by Pilar uh, J. de Moismenud, who is a member of Glitter Bean Cafe Co-op. And Pilar is a board member for the Glitter Bean Cafe Co-op in Hal Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, graduated with a degree in Latin American Studies and Political Science. They have worked in the service industry, not just as barista, but tour guide, server, and in many other positions since they were a team. Because of this, they have grown a passion for workers' rights and workers to ensure a safe and fair working environment. And we're also gonna be learning more about the work in the worker cooperative. 
Uh, so with that, I am going to pass the mic to Daniela, who's going to be uh, guiding us in this session. Gracias, Ana Martina. Y, um, es un placer, primero que nada, estar compartiendo. Thank you, Ana Martina. It is a pleasure more than anything to be sharing this space with these panelists. And I also want to welcome everyone for taking the time to be here that uh, can have the opportunity to be connected with the ecosystem, with the Federation, and with these resources that uh, we have been able to put forth through these webinars. So if you can put the next slide, please. OK, as Ana Martina mentioned, this series of webinars are part of uh, being able to share and promote a guide of resources that are so needed for us who are cooperativistas, like for instance, that is uh, uh, the tools for accountability. So uh, we already did a part of this last year in another webinar with other uh, colleagues. Uh, we did it more from the point of view of conflict though. And what we're doing today is to touch these tools and go through them, more focusing the prevention of conflict. So if you can put me, Ana Martini is going to put the link to this guide, which is very important. And it has tons of resources. It's been a lot of work to be able to put them together. So we need to take advantage of it. We have the opportunity to access information in English and in Spanish. So please uh, take advantage of this great tool. So next slide, please. As I said, we're going to review some of the tools that help us to prevent conflict in our co-ops. We always have conflict since we wake up until we go to bed, there are decisions to make and things to solve. But one of these tools are what we call check-ins. Check-ins could be uh, individuals, uh, pairs, or it could be groups. It could be within a meeting. It could be at the beginning. It could be at the end of the meeting. The interesting thing is to be able to um, do a process of these tools where you can have uh, clear objectives of what you want to achieve with the check-in, be able to uh, have an agenda and have goals, steps, and review to have this opportunity of a mutual support with someone else. And then the idea is to take notes and to uh, half the note or the minute of what's happening uh, to know that we're able to reach the objectives that this uh, tool has. <clears throat> Next. La siguiente habla de Next one talks about work plans. And it is very important, the work plans. It could be when we start the year as a co-op, we start and we do a work plan, what we want to achieve during this year. A uh, work plan, the idea is to coordinate all of these resources that we have as a group with, uh, with an end, like it could be to achieve the goals that we set throughout the year or because we have a project and it helps us manage the workflow. It helps us to see whether it's individual tasks or for a work group, it could be a committee to organize and to be able to see what are the needs, the tasks, and who will be participating from this work plan, right? So that they could be assigned. We can evaluate what is the workload that is uh, balanced, that is not just going towards one person or the other. Um, and also to be able to measure where we are, uh, with, uh, you know, that everybody uh, has a workload that is distributed. Please do let me know if you're going too fast for the interpreters. Um, I'm going to go a little slower. 
I do tend to go too fast, sorry. But for a work plan to work, you also need a project management. And this is very important so that you can have a good management is going to give us the possibility to have a good accountability and evaluation of the project or the plan that we are developing. So it is very important to have a tool where we can organize ourselves. We have the work plan, we know what the goals, we know uh, who is going to be participating, what committee is involved, which co-op member is going to be in charge of a task. But here it is important to develop a little bit more and to go maybe in further detail because this is very important for accountability. So the components of a project are knowing first, what is the task? Who is responsible for uh, performing these tasks? And also to define when is the task due? What are the deadlines, the limit dates to uh, render these tasks? And this way, the organization, um, it is very important. Many times people tend to think that because it's a co-op, everything is more relaxed and we can kind of just let things go, but it's actually the opposite. We're a group, we're making decisions together. So it's very important to organize ourselves structurally with a good work plan, with a good management. It is a tool that is very important to be able to do this and to be able to concrete goals, right? Next. Within this, we were talking a little bit about the role and the uh, decision making. But to go a little bit more in detail, it's very important to be explicit about roles. How we are going to distribute roles, who is the responsible person, who is going to participate and support, but finally someone that can say, hey, it's here, or that we can do an exchange where there's a person that is being uh, accountable in providing the information. So here, basically, we have many resources within this guy, but within the things that we use here, we have two models, Mocha or Mocha, I don't know how you want to say it. And the other one is Darcy, Mocha or Darcy. The Mocha one is more focused in finding out who is accountable who is going to be in charge for this process to be completed uh, and what's the due date and when advances should be rendered, when is the produce final due date, who is going to be responsible to be able to render this work, this task, this, who is going to help, who is participating, if they're going to have their tasks and they're going to have to organize themselves and also who is going to approve who are the responsible people of taking the decision? But Many like times it's going to happen that a committee is going to take the decision. They participate. that much sometimes we feel, and we can participate in all the decisions. But when we start growing, the idea is not for the whole co op, it's in each of the decisions or of the projects. So if we have this structure, we can determine that there is a committee that is gonna be in charge of this project and there is gonna be a person that is gonna be the person that is going to be seeing and making sure that they comply with the dates, with the process and they can exchange and perhaps is going to be approved by the entire group or maybe not. Maybe they are decisions that are not so rooted for the co-op but they are important and perhaps the committee can take them. Darcy is another tool. And this one is perhaps a little bit more focused or it has a component of accountability that there is a person that is accountable for this. And there is a 
of the decisions of the people that are responsible, who is going to be the people that will be consulting and who is going to be uh, confirm the advances and perhaps the results of the work. They're very similar and you can try both of them and see how they work for your group and they will be in the guide and you'll be able to get to details on them and how to work with these tools. Next, please. Evaluations. Evaluations are very important to also be able to provide accountability and also see what my personal or the group or the entire business's progress has been. It's also important to, therefore, to have an evaluation process. We can't just use our fingers. We need to know what we need to do, how we're doing with time, what problems we've had, where do we need support? Where do we need more or someone else from the co-op to work with that person to resolve a problem? We are not robots, we are human beings. And we continue to be also, while we are in our co-ops, parents, children, family members, and therefore it is important to have and carry out different ways to prevent and also keep conflicts from growing. I need to have a safe place to express my difficulties or else we could get stuck. And it's important to always be able to talk about that elephant in the room and not sweep problems under the rug. The basic objective is to go over performance, give, provide feedback. It's a long process usually, and it's usually done annually, but you can also say that you're going to do one at the beginning or one at the end, but you, we need to recognize that it is a long process and that in the evaluation, we're talking about how we're doing and our performance, and we need to be cautious and very respectful with each other and in the group. And so we have to provide the space for this. So, uh, recommendations define that everybody under so that everyone understands the process everyone knows when it's going to happen and what is the uh, goal what do we want to achieve with an evaluation and we need to know what we want to get out of it not just have expectations we often use the 360 evaluation system, which means looking in an entire circle, looking above, below, around, going up to the board of directors even, and also includes something that's very important, which is self-evaluation. The tool of self-evaluation is also very important because sometimes someone might say, oh, I did a terrible job with this. I can't do this. I'm no good at this. But the person who's next to you or the person who receives your product might say, no, I don't see it that way. You turned everything on time. You did a good job. So sometimes we're our worst critics. And we carry this with us. So this gives us an opportunity to reflect, to listen to other people and not just listen to our interior voices. And to look at what goes well and what's not so well also. And to have this space for personal growth and growth for the group. And sometimes we also include clients who can also participate in the process, depending on the relationship that we have with them in order, especially if we have close 
relationships with our clients. Next, please. Peer coaching. Peer coaching or mutual accompaniment is a very important element. Sometimes it's easier to talk to one person than to talk with a big group. So setting up this tool as a practice in your organization, when a new members come in, make sure they have someone that they can turn it to if they have doubts or if they need to talk to someone about their individual work plan. In my work, it is very important to, to have a work plan. And so it's good to have someone who's your peer coach. And you can provide a fresh view about what's going on and this can help the business. In order to do peer coaching, you need to have a clear goal. Why are you meeting? How often do you meet? It's best to meet regularly and to respect that frequency and the process. So, and that it's make sure it's understood. And that way you can actually achieve something with it. And you can also use the time to do check-ins. Maybe you could have a check-in every Monday or twice a month or once a month, but don't wait too long. And you can also use the time to review your targets. Sometimes we have too many and you need another voice to say, uh-uh, you're not gonna have enough time for this. Don't expect too much. Or to have somebody who says, where is time in your agenda for your own well-being? When do you have time to go out and walk or even to make your agenda? Because sometimes we look at our agendas and it's just one meeting right after another. And sometimes we realize that we didn't even have time to eat lunch. Or when can I breathe? When can I have time to focus, to think or to an analyze a project? It is important to use this tool for mutual support to prevent burnout. Because when we're working individually in our own bubbles, sometimes we think we can do it all and we can't see beyond our own burden of work. And sometimes somebody else can see more clearly what's going on. And also, if you don't express what's going on with you, the group cannot help you. So it's important to express your frustration or your difficulties. All these tools have been very helpful. What we would want to take advantage of them. And we want to take advantage of this opportunity, which can be have a big impact of talking to other cooperativists to share experiences, share reflections, and tell Vase to share failures, which aren't really failures, but more opportunities for learning. So I would like to invite once again, Um, uh, uh, people up to the stage, as it were, Marcelino and Pilar. So if we could turn off the slides and this way we can all see each other too. Thank you for being here, Pilar, Marcelina. Marcelino, I'm going to ask a question and I'm going to ask the two panelists to respond to the same question so that you can hear different perspectives and connect between them. And so I'm going to start with you, Pilar, because I'm a big feminist. Sorry, Marcelino. So if we listened a little bit about you, but if there's something you'd like to add, We'd also like to hear a little bit about your co-op. How long has it been around? Where is it? What does it do? 
And what is your role in the co-op? Hey. My uh, co-op is a cafe. Uh, we are based in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is on the east coast of Canada. A lot of Americans here. Um, and we've been around for almost four years now. We had our third year anniversary last year. Um, and if you're around here, you know that our co-op had troubled beginnings. Uh, a lot of the original founding members uh, used to work for a previous company um, that had a big labor dispute. So um, the founding members of our co-op are really passionate about not letting that happen again. Um, and one thing we are finding out right now with the pandemic is kind of trying to keep ourselves accountable to our self-care. Um, being a cafe means that we need people to come in uh, and to buy our products. We can't really ship out things a lot of the time. Um, and right now in Halifax, the COVID cases are really high. So we have closed the cafe for the time being. This is not the first time we've done it. Hopefully it will be the last. Um, but in terms of what we do, we are really just a coffee shop. Um, we provide drinks, food. We work with other businesses to um, mostly sell like their baked goods. We also sell whole coffee beans. Um, and we really, our focus as a co-op is to provide a queer space here in Halifax, an LGBT plus um, uh, area for just people to know that they can come in. We don't have gendered washrooms. Um, we don't try to use gendered language generally. Uh, and um, we try and kind of make it uh, one of the only queer businesses here in Halifax. Um, and so, yeah, we aren't very old. And uh, a lot of us are not <laughs> that experienced with co-ops uh, before having joined um, the Glitter Bean. Um, but definitely we found a lot of support around the city as well as um, from other co-ops being here, being invited is obviously a big honor. Uh, and I myself am a board member um, for our co-op. So most people are unionized members of the coffee shop, um, but legally, obviously we need board members uh, and we also have a manager. And even though we have titles, we try and have everything be a group decision amongst members. So even though I might have more responsibilities than others, um, we try and not have those hierarchies um, in our in our day to day procedures. Um, yeah. Yeah. Excelente. Muchas gracias por compartir. Um, Thank you so much. It's so interesting. Thanks for sharing. There's a lot of lessons that we'll ask you about later on, because when it's tough at the beginning and then you get on stronger footing, maybe there's something you'll be able to share with us. So right now I'm going to turn it over to Marcelino so he can answer the same question. We saw a little bit of your bio. So again, tell us what you do. How long has your co-op been around? Where is it? And what is your role? Hello, hello. I'll try to talk as slowly as possible. I'm Marcelino, I'm in Brooklyn. And I'm part of a co-op that's called Radiate Consulting. This co-op was incubated with DAWI, the Dem Democracy at Work Institute in Los Angeles. We started, which that didn't work out, but it did in, in New York. And it's been around since 2019. Um, what services do we offer? The co-op focuses, it's a service co-op in general. And we wanted to be able to provide different services, which include accounting or bookkeeping services, uh, web design, a little bit of an admin in combination with programs. We also used to offer graphic design 
but we're always trying to include different kinds of services. And we mainly work with other co-ops and nonprofit organizations. I'm, or I was the administrator and the bookkeeper of the co-op. I wore two hats because we like to include members as much as possible, and all of them. In, and we want to include them as much as possible. So fortunately, we have been doing well, which is different to other co-ops that had a really hard time during 2020. Uh, our business continues to grow despite the pandemic. We were very fortunate in this sense because our co-op is growing as time passes by. And this year, we're going to be recru recruiting more members for the co-op. Uh, definitely one of the services that people ask a lot are accounting services. That is all I have. Oh, something quickly, actually. I used to do both uh, roles, uh, administration and accounting. But now we um, involved another member for the co-op that is uh, doing the role of administrator. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt, but it was like leadership. This person is uh, taking the leadership of this area. They uh, told me here that we forgot your bias. Is there something that you want to add Maybe a little bit more about you. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, I worked in a bar. Um, I didn't want to do this all my life. It was my time to graduate. And I didn't know what I was going to do. So I contacted, in fact, that way, because I have heard about co-ops. I contacted Adawi and they were looking for members for the co-op that they were going to start in New York. So I saw the entire process from having a group of people that came from different nonprofits and they were asked what type of services do you need? Uh, in having a co-op that could offer you these services. I saw the entire process. I even apply for the co-op and I stayed. So it's been something very cool because without wanting to, uh, I was contacted by other co-ops and they asked me a little bit of help, advice. I don't consider myself uh, like a person with a lot of knowledge, but I do like to share what I know. So it's been a great experience, experience to be a part of a co-op. Great, thank you. So much need in Spanish uh, of resources to be able to access this type of resources. And um, what can be better of from this peer system or peer support than sharing our experiences together during this path. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. I didn't know that, um, that Los Angeles hadn't resulted. It's a shame, but it's a beautiful project, but I, I'm glad that this new incubation could take place. So I would like as well that I'm going to come back to Pilar and ask you, we put here a set of tools that, or a toolkit like um, that we share like a summary, but from these tools, do you use, uh, or what is the tool that you have discovered or that you use to prevent conflict 
to organize yourself better? What are these tools where you have this sense of accountability? I have a really hard time saying accountability in Spanish, but of being maybe responsible and transparent, right? I found during the pandemic even more important. Um, originally, uh, before in the before times, um, before the pandemic, our meetings, our monthly meetings would be held at our cafe. Um, but now, obviously for safety reasons, they are held over Zoom, which is not nearly as pleasant uh, or as engaging, um, but certainly one of the expectations we don't have is people don't need to have their cameras on. They don't need to speak if they don't have the energy for it because we have our meetings after our uh, opening hours. So sometimes you've worked there all day and you need to go on and get on your computer. So uh, obviously that isn't something that's very important for us, um, but we tr do try and check in with each other. Um, at the beginning in terms of how everyone's um, mental health is doing uh, and how people are feeling generally, as well as uh, in every step of our meeting, we ask um, before we move on to the next point in our agenda, if anyone would like to bring something up. Um, so if we're talking about uh, health and safety concerns at the end of what our manager, Lorelai, has to say on the official agenda, anyone is welcome to pipe in and say, hey, I've noticed that the milk fridge is frosting over again, which is a problem for us. Mm -hmm. um, or even just more unpleasant things like, hey, I have noticed anti-maskers are coming into our store more and more and causing problems for us. Mm -hmm. um, and especially working in customer service, check-ins are vital because if I have had a negative experience with a customer, um, I don't always know if on the day I wasn't there or while I was on my break, um, that same person might have caused a problem for someone else and just to know and just to check in with other people. And that keeps everyone honest and level with each other. Um, mm. And it also helps that our co-op is not very big. I would say I'm bad at math, but we can, we are not more than 12 members. It is a huh. small co-op. So being... Um, keeping lines of communication open with each other is a priority and it is also easier because of our small numbers um, mm -hmm. and even with zoom we try and at the very least use the uh reactions i'm gonna use one now this one's our favorite it's a little <laughs> confetti so whenever we say does anyone is everyone all right with this should we move on people will either do a thumbs up or a confetti um, and that's just one of the small ways we try and check in with each other to prevent conflict before it starts. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, like I said, COVID has been rough for check-ins and meetings, but I think everyone finds ways to adapt. <laughs> Si no, somos animales de costumbres, al final nos estamos acostumbrando, espero que... Right, we're uh, animals of customs, right? We are becoming, uh, we have to be careful, we don't get used to all of this, we have to hopefully be able to come back and hug each other with trust and confidence. I see the passion we are with COVID and how we continue uh, this idea uh, uh, that we can find each other in a place because the camera is turned off um, and if the camera is not on, but it's always having this opportunity of perhaps putting on the chat or another, you know, I can see you're doing okay. How important it is that we reconnect uh, each other as human beings to, to stay connected. We always have things to deal with and to solve. So thank you, Pilar. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. I also want to remind you to access these guides. There are a lot of resources that we have done with a lot of time, a lot of care, and there's a lot of responsibility. And we have to do it uh, with tools because uh, don't forget to access this guide. Marcelino, I want to ask you, what tools? Did you have, how many are you? Did you mention it? We're 10 members. And within these tools, 
do you have any other that you use to see or on a way to prevent uh, the conflict? The what? I was seeing about the tools. We mentioned check-ins. We talked about the work plan. We talk about uh, project management, evaluations, the peer coaching. Something that happened very interesting that it, because I have a, two roles, it's a lot of responsibilities. Uh, when the person that has COVID, all the others will have under one member. We're hearing some background rules. No, se había un poco de ruido, pero ya se fue. Me parece que cerraron el micrófono ya. Yeah, there was a little bit of of uh, sound, uh, but I think they closed the mic already. Right. So I was saying that yes, we constantly something uh, that uh, happen is that members most members that participate in the co-op is because we knew each other in person. So we know each other a little bit more. I think that helps a lot. That is something that I saw different to another co-op that we recently did it during the pandemic and they, and they had never met physically. And there wasn't this union that I saw with my co-op. Uh, because something that happens in my co-op is that we set goals. For instance, the recruitment committee is going to recruit three new members before June. That is the goal that we have set. Uh, every time we have a meeting monthly, they speak a little bit of the process. So it's a little bit of um, the accountability that they have to teach all of this information. Same with the finance committee. Um, these committees and these people that help uh, the co-op, they help a lot because one person cannot do everything. So this is very helpful. Uh, I guess the column check-ins. Excellent, excellent, thank you. I was thinking about this um, and, and a question went by, but it is how it is. Um, I was thinking about what are, for instance, Pilar, what are the challenges? I don't know if you have had a process where new partners come in, because it always happens with a group starts and then it's a time to grow and you want to bring new members and there be this process of, of the recruitment process. How does this person incorporate to this culture that has formed within the group? So there is a, uh, an importance as far as the process so that this person is not just the new person and feels isolated perhaps. So independent of incorporated to trainings, this is how committees work. And this, uh, this is how the reports are. Um, how is there a process that you have uh, mentoring? Is there a process that you have when you have new members? Yes. Uh, a year and a little bit now since I've been um, a part of the cafe. Uh, and we've had some original members who are no longer part of the co-op. Um, I think for us, it's important for us to realize that we are a cafe and we are a co-op. And um, some people come with a lot of years of customer service on their backs and that they don't necessarily want to stay in this industry forever, which is very valid. I have had terrible customer service jobs in my life um 
And I think we all have. So coming into this co-op, we, all of the newer members, have very strong feelings about um, workers' rights and how we want our business to be run and how we want to be treated um, mm -hmm. moving forward. So most people come in with that. And if they don't, it's always important to remind them. Uh, one thing I saw myself falling into that I quickly trained myself out of is just respecting yourself as a worker and not letting others disrespect you. Mm -hmm. Between each other in the co-op, there's full respect always, but it is an unfortunate part of customer service culture in Canada, as well as in the United States, that some people come into shops, any kind of coffee shop or boutique or retailer, and they think that they can treat workers a certain way. And in a lot of places and in a lot of my previous jobs, that has been the case. They were just allowed to yell at me and, you know, just the abuse. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen it or experienced it. Um, but for us, it was very important to put a stop to that and to tell myself, if someone's treating me rude, I can and will just ask them to leave. And when I see someone treating uh, newer members of our co-op, I see them being treated that way. I ask them to leave as well. Thankfully, our clientele is not like that. Um, and it does not happen often. But for us, bringing someone into our team, they're usually very happy to be working in a place where they are allowed to assert themselves as workers and they're allowed to assert their rights. Um, and that really comes, that culture comes from uh, the Glitter Beans beginnings in a labor dispute. Um, because like I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of our founding members uh, were never paid for a couple of months. And it was all over the press here in Halifax and everyone working in coffee shops had heard about this. Every barista in the city had heard about it. I had heard about it too. Um, and I was like 18 at the time. Uh, nope, I was older. But that, that culture, starting the co-op by deciding to treat each other fairly and to compensate our labor and to create this business um, that would not only be a safe space, but also for the queer community, but also for ourselves. Um, and to make sure that that kind of treatment isn't tolerated helps in onboarding people. Um, because when people come into a new customer service job, they're usually trying to sniff out the culture, what's allowed, what isn't allowed, you know, uh, I've done it before too, and every other job I've had in my life. Um, and just, you know, something as simple as like, there aren't any customers around and you've already cleaned everything up, sit down. There's no reason for you to be standing up. An act as simple as just being like, hey, grab a milk crate, sit down. There's nothing to do right now, you know? That in itself is mind blowing to someone who works at, you know, perhaps more corporate shops or in places where they aren't treated right. And that that's kind of it's the small things for us as a as a coffee shop that can really help newer members um, feel more welcome. And once they feel more welcome and once you introduce them into the culture, people are very willing um, to kind of like jump in and do a lot of like maybe the less pleasant work of like the deep cleaning tasks. You know, I don't love cleaning the garbages every month, but I'll do it because I like working here and I want to invest in a workplace that takes care of me. Um, and that's, you know, that's a good way to bring people in um, and to keep growing that culture and making sure it stays there. If people feel like, hey, they can have a voice and that voice is heard, then they're much more willing to put more effort into the co-op and into the business and to create something where we can all come together and not just have a good time, but make a living. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Qué, qué interesante y qué importante todo lo que están mencionando. Además, cada... What you're saying is so important, and, um, especially in this industry, every, in all industries, everybody brings, well, you know, with this general or regular abuse, when you have direct contact with customers, a lot comes up. But often there's this culture of the customer is always right. And so it's important 
to also recognize and know about the experience that each new member has and also to understand that the way things are done is not written in stone and that new people have a voice and they can use it and when they realize that they're being cared for then they also know that they need to contribute too thank you so much May, I love the storytelling. Marcelino, your turn. Have you had to go through recruitment or are you just with the same folks from the beginning? This will be the third time that we're recruiting. And we've learned over time from this when we interview people, we need to explain a little bit about the concept because it's a little complicated. It's a little hard to explain this concept of not being an employee. And when you're providing services to a client that you are representing the co-op, it's a little hard to do. We need to um, f focus a little more on that and, and learn to explain a little bit better what the process is and what they do in the co-op. And we also say, if you have ideas, bring them up. You will have the opportunity to collaborate. And once you're in the co-op, feel free to contribute and to speak up about what's going well, what's not going well around all the operations. And that we welcome this kind of collaboration because each person has their own way of thinking and has their own ideas. And so we want everyone to participate. And so when certain members don't, um, aren't engaged, it gets a little tricky. Fortunately, everybody is involved in the co-op and we're also, where when a new co-op member comes in, we pair them up with uh, another person who's already in the co-op and they're in constant contact. If any questions come up and this really helps them feel welcome. And it's an opportunity for them to express anything and helps them and it helps the co-op in general thank you this is great this is a tool this is mentoring which is a tool doing check-ins responding to questions we also would like to open up the floor for direct to direct questions from the people who are listening. I know we're not sitting around in the cafe, drinking good coffee and hanging out and chatting, but, but it, you know, grab your mate, your tea, your water. And we can, toast each other so you can either um, uh, unmute or you can put your questions in the chat. We do have a question. I'm in a three member co-op. We just hired a halftime person. How can we keep from having hierarchy and divisions between workers and worker owners 
especially in regarding decision making. Would one of you like to go ahead, Pilar? I myself was hired part time initially uh, with the glitter bean. Um, and I think an important thing to understand is that seniority is always going to factor into decision making, um, even just on a cultural level. The new person is never going to know as much as um, the person who has been there for a while. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing because they can bring a lot of um, new and different perspectives, um, which is what I myself tried to bring as someone who worked in other places, uh, who had a different working culture, who came from a different country entirely, um, and that you really need to embrace that newness and not shy away from it. Um, and also just to answer questions. One thing I've had difficulty with is I didn't always know the things that didn't come up very often. If, you know, a big inventory only happens once a month and I have, and it is now coming up, I didn't know how to do inventory or I didn't know how to proceed during budget meetings, the yearly review budget meetings. Um, and kind of getting on a new person's level and just explaining things to them um, can not just help you remember being new to this and remember learning all of this, but can help them bring bring them to your level and just kind of make the culture a little bit closer. It's appreciated on the part of the new person. Um, and it also brings people more on a ground level. If everyone is having the same refresher or learning things at the same time, um, then that creates a much more even level um, where mm -hmm. you can take uh, decisions and not have, like you said, a hierarchy, because that is scary and you, you don't want that happening, but not acknowledging it uh, blatantly is probably, it doesn't, it doesn't feel good as the new person um, and it doesn't make you feel good either. So just say, oh, you're new, here are things that you need to know and just give them a space to ask as many questions as they need or they want. Um, and that way, you know, it's out in the open and just ask them, what do you think about things? Um, what do you think we should do about this? And even just ask them what they think about things that are already working. If you find that, you know, a certain check-in is working for um, all of you folks, you know, even if it's working, asking them what they think about it uh, is a good way to hear their voice and to let them have a platform. And that kind of starts to bridge that gap that the seniority can create. Mm -hmm. Muchas gracias. ¿Quieres agregar algo más, Marcelino? Eh, una de las cosas es que ayuda bastante. Es un modelo. Yeah. There's um, a model. It, our operations manual says that everyone has one voice, a vote. And that helped our membership a lot. In every meeting, we let people know that there's no owners in ours. There's no there's no one owner. There's no managers in our co-op. There's no there's an orchestrator who's there to support the membership. And we shouldn't fall into the trap that this meeting we're going to do this or that. And when somebody's going to do a specific job, then we have to let them know that we're there to support them. Nobody is the manager of anyone else. You can't force anybody to do something. Um, that's, I've also seen this in other co-ops that people who don't feel free to talk about these things don't participate a lot and they're not that engaged. And I, so the emphasis needs to be that on the fact that the person who is in charge is the one who's supporting the work. 
put it in so much just to play. And that everybody needs to just be big question, question everything. I'd like to just add a little bit when you mentioned the operations manual, I can add that when the person who comes in at, at half time to understand what the benefits are, what does it mean? What does my participation mean? And to monitor this in the business and know well what their responsibilities are in the governance of the organization. As you mentioned, it's one person, one vote, no matter how many hours you work. And this is tricky. If hierarchies end up getting established in the administration, and there are benefits that are fair and they may be different depending on how much somebody works. Um, uh, Susana's coming in here, unless you'd like to add something, Marcelino. Uh, let me give you a chance again, Marcelino, and then we'll listen to Susana and then other people. Just quickly, it's often intimidating in many places when certain people are in the co-op are generating more income and that they have, it's easier for them to find clients. And some of us may feel we're not participating enough, but it shouldn't be this way. Our co-op is totally different than that. And you are so right. All the gears are fit with all the others and everyone in the business has to support everyone else. We cannot, it won't work unless we're all helping each other. And then um, Susana, Sela, and then a third person. Susana, go ahead. Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Thank you. I'm a home health aide and with other co-workers, we are forming a co-op right now. But since it's just her and me, to be able to create a co-op, we know you can't with just two people. According to the format that we're using, we're in New Mexico. So we are recruiting people right now. And tomorrow we're going to have a, a meeting with four new members. And I'd like to know what you all would recommend to me about carrying out the process. We're at the beginning. We don't have the co-op yet. We are recruiting new co-founders. So I want to know what recommendations you all have for us on how to proceed in creating a new co-op harmoniously so that we can all get to the same point. If anybody wants to go, okay, Marcelino, I see you. Well, in my opinion, I would say that there are organizations such uh, as uh where you can find a toolkit that can help you see step by step. I could say that the nonprofit organization that incubate my co-op could provide all that help. I, being honest, starting from zero, is I, I first first and foremost I admire what you're doing. Um, an organization that is more familiarized with the process would help a lot. I would say that uh, the Work Institute could help with this process. 
Thank you. And I don't know if you could share that information to me. Si, I could. Uh, Pilar wanted to add something and I'm going to give you a more direct contact in Mexico for sure. También quiero eh, mencionar que estoy de acuerdo con lo que han dicho Martelina y Gabriela, pero que cuando nosotros empezamos, ninguna de nosotros teníamos experiencia manejando un negocio, menos una cooperativa. Y una cosa que nos ayudó y nos continúa a ayudar es hablar a nos, con nuestra comunidad local. Tenemos eh, muchos miembros y miembros de nuestra comunidad que nos llamó y ofrecieron su uh, eh, consejo financiero legal y, y cualquier otro tipo de ayuda porque querían que, que, que tuviésemos éxito y que los miembros no fueron eh, no solamente los que fundaron, sino los nuevos eh, con metas de a dónde quieren llegar y cómo se quieren ver como un como un negocio, como una cooperativa, pero también saber lo que tu comunidad puede hacer para apoyarle. Quizá no como miembros de la cooperativa, pero miembros de la comunidad a la cual tú le vas a vender. Perdón por la interrupción, pero no estamos escuchando la interpretación al español. Oh, no. Me, me puedo repetir en español. Sí, se, sí se podía volver a repetir o... Oh. Sí. Perdón, vale. um, decidí solo hablar en inglés, pero si es más fácil. I decided only speak in English because it was easy. Uh, something uh, was members of my city of the community, parents of member uh, that gave us help with legal things, administration, finances, uh, to say, Uh, that perhaps they had businesses and they did this type of work to be able to say what they were doing as members of the community, they're going to know. So here in Halifax, for instance, we have different laws than they do in Mexico and New Mexico. Uh, so that help was very useful and it helped us um, get this idea. We're not a copy of another co-op, but we um i know that they talk among themselves um how they wanted to be and they could decide that not only with the help of these resources um but also uh, to be able to create a business that works in your city or in your community because they're going to be these people that you're going to sell your product, but they're also going to be able to see you as a business and as a co-op. Thank you so much, Pilar. I would only add that there is also a, the Federation here in Mexico City. I don't know if it's in Mexico City, but I could also contact you. Uh, if you send me your email, I then will send this information that I don't have it with you at this moment. So if somebody else has it, please write your name in the chat. Uh, I just wanted for closing, uh, the idea is that um, the process um, uh, or fundadores for those who started the, the funders, it's important to, to have the mission and the vision that you have as a business, I feel that this process is very important. It's going to do that if the basis in which you are together, is it like the reasons why I got married? Uh, sometimes I have to think, why did I get married? Why did I, why did I get that decision? Because there are a lot of challenges and the business is also going to have high moments, low moments. So it is so important to be able to come back to this niche and be able to say why we came together, why did we decide to take this risk together, why did we decide to advance and take these decisions and others to be able to understand and to regroup and to be able to say, hey, let's keep going. What do we have to adjust? What do we have to adjust? What is not working? So this group, the this group, this funding, uh, the funders group, the 
the group that funded the founded the business is going to be the root is going to be where everything is established in this business that's what i i would add this um come to the community to the federation to organizations that can support to come close to your community and see what they need not what they want to sell but what they need how you are going to satisfy their need i also wanted to mention that the federation of co-ops here uh oh, federation of workers offers a free webinar for new starting co-ops this is where I think you could start. And uh, it is a webinar that we do open, we do it in English. And um, we have some more dates in Spanish. I wanted to read some of the questions that were in the chat. There are some questions that are directed uh, regarding payments um, and equity. So I wanted to tell you that we're going to have a session uh, farther ahead that is going to be uh, regarding payments to members. So perhaps this question, I would invite you to come to this session and maybe talk a little bit about how to deal with the um, antiquity of members. And we're going to talk about this in the seminar. There's a few questions that I wanted to read, seniority of members. I'm going to read it in English. We or do each of your co-workers have sets of a specific tasks and how does your setup support accountability in a good way? Um, from a cafe point of view, um, we have duties that um, fall on whoever is working that day. So be opening, it means getting the coffee ready you know food so things that are to do with the day-to-day -day running of the business fall on whoever is working that day obviously if you have saturdays off you don't have to be there to take out the garbage at the end of the night um other responsibilities that don't come up as often or that are very person specific uh do happen on a volunteer basis um, the way our membership works is that you have to put in a certain number of tasks in order to um, maintain membership. And usually what these are for what it looks like for us is deep cleaning tasks, the unpleasant ones. <laughs> Everyone has to do one big deep clean task a day or not a day per month, my bad. So I, like I mentioned before, despise cleaning the garbages. Um, so perhaps what I'll do is a deep clean of all the floors, right? I move all the tables and I clean everything and it's, I don't enjoy it, but everyone does it because it's much more manageable um, in as a group. Um, and so those tasks, the cleaning ones that maintain membership are monthly and rotating. So you're not always stuck doing the same one and they generally all get done um, because we have a shared document where everyone signs up for one big one and three small tasks you know cleaning all the dishware deep cleaning all the dishware is easy um and one of the small ones and like i said deep cleaning the all the fridges thawing out the freezers those are big ones um when it comes to administrative duties um that have to do with our cash flow or other more sensitive documents um those are up to our board members as well as our manager and those are also on a volunteer basis. Um, I myself take care of our cash flow. So I make sure that our tills are fully stocked, that our cash box is stocked, um, because my name is one of the names on the bank account. Um, and so for sensitive tasks like that, um, that kind of require a single hand and not necessarily many people, you know, it doesn't take more than one person to make sure our till always has, you know, a certain number of bills or coins. Um, I'm the only person who does that. But I wasn't around for a month, so I had to delegate that to someone else. And um, when you have such a small co-op, it's a lot easier to have those tasks be on a volunteer basis. Who is posting the invoices? Who is calling the um, our dairy cooperative that we buy our milk from? Um, and those tasks are volunteer basis for the most part. Um, but 
without them, we can't keep going as a business. So there's always someone who ends up volunteering for them because no one wants to be working at a coffee shop with no milk. So someone's always calling the dairy people. Muchas gracias. Marcelino, ¿tú quisieras agregar algo? O... Um, thank you so much. Marcelino, would you like to add something? Yes, the way we do it in our co-op, uh, the way that we do it is that each month we have where all the members are, we have a board meeting or, or a meeting where all the members are. And perhaps they designate the things to do uh, for operations and what happens is that the members say the volunteer that i'll do it so we put a due date which by when does this task or by when this tax needs to be completed so the administrator <clears throat> is constantly checking with this person hey how is this task going do you need help is there something difficult? Do you need support? So this is the way that we assign the tasks. And the next month, when we review the tasks that we've done, we say, hey, I already completed this task. Uh, I couldn't do it uh, because the situation came out. So this is the way in which we assign tasks. And we accept it uh, via committees. We know that when we're recruiting people, we know that it has to be done by the recruitment committee, right? Because it has to be, but that's how we do it. We mention the needs and we put a due date and if they, they need support, we're there to support whoever needs it. There is one more question, Daniela, that I want to read for you. Also, because we're coming close to the end of the session, what can be done when you don't want to comply with the operation agreement with the members, uh, forgetting that as a part of the co-op, our, our, our owners, there's a new question that is started um, that has to do with this. What happens when the people don't want to, um, <clears throat> do not want to follow through with the responsibilities or commitments? I also want to add the other one, the other question, which is what happens when new people want to change the already established agreement, correct? So let's go. I don't know. Pilar or Marcelino. Marcelino, perhaps you want to take it. A little bit about whether a member, a new member can change things regularly. Uh, it is it is established what is needed in order to change things in many things it could be a vote by majority to change things which means that all members are in agreement in changing something that's the good thing that you should put on a manual um, and how can you change things in the manual regularly there are certain decisions that require that majority say yes or no and there are certain decision that oh, with a 75 percent of the vote so that's going to help a lot if they don't want to do what they want to do good grief that would i have seen that in co-ops co it can create a hostile, really yucky environment. I think that what you need to do is come to consensus. These are certain things that you have to do 75% of the time. And if most people are in favor of a decision, then somebody is not able to oppose the decision. But you need to have a way you're going to do consensus so it doesn't get in the way to keep people from being scattered all over the place. That's 
what I can say, but you can't force people, a member to do something they don't want to do. So it's best to come to an agreement. And perhaps if, if somebody really isn't in line with your co-op, it would be good to talk to them and say, maybe it's time for us to separate. Thank you very much. We are unfortunately running out of time. We do have a couple of short minutes left. If you want to add something, Pilar. I absolutely agree with everything Marcelino has said. Uh, another thing that is important, at least for us, is to check in with the person. If someone is unable or unwilling to fulfill their duties um, or functions in a co-op, um, it isn't necessarily out of malice or out of non-compliance uh, and checking in with them uh, either one-on-one -on -one or over email or however they prefer to figure out what is happening, um, especially with COVID going on, it is hard to sometimes get tasks started or get them done. Um, and especially for us as someone who speaks or deals with the public, that can come down to right now as an immunocompromised person, I'm uncomfortable working in the cafe exposed to the public or any other number of uh, mental health things and accessibility issues or anything along those lines uh, and checking in with the person and trying to figure out together why they aren't fulfilling these duties can then lead you to realizing maybe this person isn't fit to do X or Y duty and they should instead be doing this other one and then someone else can take over their original duties. Um, so those jobs and those tasks can get done. Um, and once you've done that work of putting it in, usually I find that those problems get fixed. Um, however, if you do check in with someone and you try and figure out what's wrong and they're still not helping you, um, that is an unfortunate situation. And if it really turns out that they aren't a good fit for the co-op, that is unfortunate. But mm -hmm. usually trying to, at least for us, it works that um, if you get down on their level and try and just understand why it is that they're not fulfilling their jobs, we can kind of shift gears and find alternative routes to get the task done um, and to keep contributing to a culture of, you know, openness checking in uh, and making sure everyone's voice is heard because if someone's not doing their job, usually there's a reason for it. And sometimes it stops them from being able to work at all. And sometimes it just needs adjustments and accommodations. Muchas gracias. Sí, también estoy de acuerdo con ambos. Sí, muchas gracias por venir. Muchas gracias por aceptar esta invitación, por compartir todo lo que Thank trae. you so much. I agree with both of you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for accepting the invitation and sharing your worlds with us. I'm also want to thank you for the invitation. So Ana Martina, did you want to take over? Thank you very much. Thank you. We want to thank everybody for your participation, to Daniela for her facilitation, to the interpreters, to the panelists. Uh, Marcelino and Pilar, and to all the uh, people who helped out with the logistics, and from the people from the Canadian Federation, we will be sending out the materials and the recordings to everyone who is registered, along with the guide. I do want to share uh, some of the upcoming webinars and events that we're going to have in the Federation. On February 4th, we're going to have a session for startup co-ops. You can register on the, the Federation web page, uh, usworker.coop. And this is just going to be in English. On February 11th, we're going to have a Union Co-ops Council public updates call, again, just in English. On February 16th, since tax season is coming, we're going to have a session on preparing your co-op for tax season in the US 
context and this session will be interpreted in English and Spanish. And then on February 24th, we're going to have an update called the Worker Co-op Policy Pulse. And that will be on February 24th. And then last, we are going to have tax prep for LLC co-ops. And this again is for LLCs in the United States. Daniela is going to facilitate this. Uh, she has experience with taxes and LLCs. And we would like to thank you all so much for being here and for supporting the co-op movement. And you can also support us through our monthly donor or sustainer program. Uh, or you can make a one-time donation. These donations help us to be able to provide programs such as this and others that strengthen co-ops. Thank you again for being here. And we hope to see you all real soon in the upcoming co-op clinic programs. It's such a pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> see y'all. Hey, Hazel. Good to see you. Hope you all